You could argue then, well, what are some of the newer roles of PCR, uh, apart from a sensitive diagnostic test? Uh, one is the discussion about viral load. We know with lots of other things like uh, HRV, Hep C, uh, Hep B, CMV and the like, that quantifying the amount of virus in a particular sample, usually blood, is very helpful in assessing indications for therapy and responses to therapy. Not so the case really in herpes, but I don't think that this has been fully explored yet and there may yet be a role for quantitation. There's some argument that if you can do PCRs quickly, and you get a positive result uh, from someone who's asymptomatically shedding, you might be able to advise them that they're, 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 they're sort of shedding and therefore reduce transmission. It's the sort of thing that comes out of the study that I showed you previously with the frequency of shedding. But uh, at the practical level, I'm not sure how this, this would occur, at least at this stage. PCR is a basis, of course, for uh, some of the assays that we use for resistance testing. Fortunately, and unlike HIV and some of the other diseases, Clinically significant drug resistance is not common, um, for which uh, we must be grateful. But if you are going, if you do need to do these assays, then they are PCR-based. And of course, there's a lot of other pathogenesis things to do to, to do as well. I just highlight a couple of recent papers uh, just in the last few weeks. One of which looked at uh, the amount of shedding from uh, uh, the mouth in people with genital H confirmed genital HSV2. Uh, and this was really quite interesting, in other words, showing that uh, there was a lot of shedding uh, from the oral mucosa as well as from the genital uh, uh, region in people with genital HSV2. I think this is really quite interesting, much more so with HSV2 than HSV1, um, but I think, again, uh, this is uh, of potential interest. And also, if you use PCR and molecular techniques to look at what sort of viruses you get out of people who have recurrent uh, 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 infections. And there's the suggestion that, in fact, uh, uh, people may well have different subtypes or strains of herpes uh, being shed from the genital uh, tract, particularly if they have HIV, and whether this reflects sort of different reactivation of different, different viral strains from the, from the adjacent dorsal root ganglia or reinfection with different strains um, is yet to be determined. And just to, to sort of uh, finish up on the PCR, there are um, a couple of problems, of course, with PCR. I guess I've really mentioned them. Uh, I think what it, what it really means is that you need to know what sort of PCR assay your laboratory is providing, uh, public versus private, there are differences and so on, what sort of things they're looking for. Are they typing the virus? Are they detecting other viruses, for example, as I mentioned before, with varicella zoster, et cetera, et cetera. And there are still issues for the laboratory in, in things like the quality assurance and the quality of the results that you're getting from the laboratory. Um, and there are intermittent problems with false positives and false negatives, which I won't go into. And just to finish up with, with uh, HSV type specific serology, again, you could spend a half an hour on this, but, but in just in a slide or two, uh, uh, you do develop type specific antibody testing. I think the older style non-type specific serology is not particularly useful except in the very occasional clinical situation, um, but generally uh, type specific serology has been very useful in diagnosis and in sort of seroepidemiology studies as Adrian alluded to. Of course, once you have IgG to type 1 or type 2 HSV, you have that for life. So it's not always, th these tests aren't always helpful in timing when infection occurs. And also IgM uh, uh, may sort of rise and fall a bit, particularly in people who get severe recurrences. So this can be sometimes a little bit difficult in so sorting out whether people have a, a, a true uh, primary infection or, or the first presentation of recurrent disease. Um, and uh, uh, obviously if you have type 2 antibodies, that generally implies a genital infection, whereas type 1 antibody, uh, again as we heard in the first talk, doesn't you still have to sort out whether this is something perhaps acquired in childhood as cold sores or a sexually transmitted uh, infection in, in, in uh, adolescence or adult life. And uh, so when you might use these is open to lots of discussion, but these are some of the reasons why uh, certainly in, uh, people seeking serology testing in the context of new relationships and transmission and so on whether it should be part of a routine sexual health screen, I think, is uh, controversial. 
Um, where it's certainly useful in clinical situations where you can't get the other testing done um, or the presentation is late and, and so on, uh, unusual clinical presentations. Um, perhaps in a, just like it is with typing of one or two, it does help in giving some prognosis advice to the patient as to whether they've got type 1 or type 2 in the genital area, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how you might use it importantly to prevent neonatal transmission, which we'll hear about uh, later, I think is difficult. You know, should you be screening uh, uh, mothers uh, for HSV antibodies? If so, do you have to screen the sexual partner as well? Do you have to screen at various times during the pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera? It's difficult. And whether you should do it as a screening test as part of the workup of HIV infected individuals. I do uh, do it in clinical practice, but a lot of people uh, don't. And would argue the toss. And the last slide is um, just to show that we did look at this uh, uh, some years ago in our local clinic at Parramatta, just to see why testing was being done. Uh, and and uh, as you would predict, and I said, I guess somewhat similar to what Adrian presented, much more like the population were much more likely to be type 1 antibody positive, um, but a fair proportion were HSV2 antibody positive. And the reasons for testing were usually, uh, well, look, I'll leave it up there for you to look at, but usually in people who had partners with genital herpes and they were kind of wanting to know their own status, or because of unrecognised or undiagnosed clinical disease. Um, and, and even uh, for screening purposes. So, so that gives you some indication as to how these assays uh, might be using. So I'll finish up there by saying that I don't think there's a best test to do. There is a range of tests to do for genital herpes. Um, but I do think it's important that uh, people who work in STIs need to know what their laboratory is supplying and have some idea of the value and the quality of the, the assays being provided because there is some variation. Thank you.